God of forever, tonight will you break and then mend, empty and then fill up, speak and we'll listen. You are ours. We claim you. We call you our God. We are your people. We are your children. Condescend to us again. And in this place, on this night, get glory for your great name. We ask this for Christ's sake. Amen. Amen. If you'll allow, I'll read a couple of verses that we've already read tonight to anchor our thoughts. And this is where I'd like for you to be joining me in um, where we'll be speaking tonight. A dispute also arose among them as to which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. And he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors, but not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become as the youngest and the leader as one who serves. For who is the greater, one who reclines at table or one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at table? But I am among you as the one who serves. Verses 24 through 27. And we'll be thinking about the question, will we see him? In response to this gospel reading, there is a question that I want us to answer, a question that I would like for us to consider tonight, and that question is, will we see him? The disciples have shared the Passover meal with Jesus. He's washed their feet. It's the last night on earth for him before he would be impaled on a pole. Now, I know, I know that's not a pleasant thought, but I think about what the disciples had witnessed in Jesus leading up to this moment, and that, for me, is an incredible thought. We're told throughout the Gospels of otherworldly wonders being performed by Jesus, and the twelve, they were right there to see it. Crowds cheering, mobs gathering overnight to be near this power-filled prophet. The twelve, they had a front row seat to it all. Shouts from the roadside, folks climbing trees to get a glance. The disciples saw the attention that Jesus received. They saw his influence. They saw his authority, leading some of them to say, hey, when you're no longer around. Will you pick me to be your replacement? Because I like what I see. And if this soon-to-be-established kingdom is anything like this, I want to be seated right beside you because I, I like what I see. But I find it interesting that during the same span of life lived out before them, the same few years of close fellowship with them, while he performed miracles and unexplainable deeds before their eyes, Jesus simultaneously displayed incredible acts of humility and love and service toward others. In their presence, he would sacrifice, forgive, and encourage. He paid attention to the broken heart. He lived simply. He cared much. So when I consider the disciples' question about who would be the greatest, I can't help but wonder, did they see him? Did they really see him? All of this grappling for attention and striving to be seen wanting to be elevated and exalted, liked and followed, were they seeing him? Were they seeing things around him? 
I've been to a handful of weddings in my time, and I'm sure that I, like many of you, have looked around at beautiful flowers, stunning venues, decorations, the cake, the ring, the gown, captivated by it all, finding it difficult to take in all the splendor. But I can imagine that in a room filled with folks, many looking like me, looking around at all of the loveliness, there are at least two people in that place whose eyes are fixed and focused on what's important. Their gaze is locked in, seeing what matters most in that moment. Because what those two people know is this. The spectacle all around them only exists because they are there. There would not be flowers, cakes, gowns, rings. All of the spectacle all around them only exists because they are there. The trinkets are not as important as the treasure body of Christ. We must not let anything distract us from seeing our Savior. Story goes that there was a flood of petty theft in the Soviet Union, and guards were placed at the stations at some of the factories to curtail some of the stealing and the thievery. And at one particular timber yard, the guard knew all of the workers that were at the factory. He knew them well. And one evening, a worker at the factory, Mr. Petrovich, was headed home with a wheelbarrow. And on the wheelbarrow, there was this great bulky sack with a suspicious-looking item inside of it. The guard said, all right, Petrovich, what have you got there? Oh, just sawdust and shavings, said Mr. Petrovich. Come on, the guard said. I wasn't born yesterday. Tip it out, tip it out. Mr. Petrovich tipped over the wheelbarrow, and out came nothing but sawdust and shavings. So he was allowed to put all of it back into the wheelbarrow, and he headed off home. When the same thing happened every night for a full week, the guard became so frustrated. And finally, his curiosity overcame his frustration. And he said, Petrovich, 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 I know you. Tell me what it is that you're smuggling out of here, and I promise I'll let you go. Mr. Petrovich said, you promise? If I tell you what I'm stealing, you'll let me go. He said, yes, I'll let you go. He said, I'm stealing wheelbarrows. <laughs> Distractions. Will we see him? Or will we see the world and things around him? Tonight, as always, Jesus invites us, the church, his bride, to see him to see his humility, to see his kindness, to see his benevolence, to see his charity, to see how he ministers, to see how he is patient with others. May we be the bride who is so captivated by our groom that we never tire of gazing at his goodness. May our eyes know nothing of wandering or losing focus. May we tonight and always see him. But when we see him, I believe that because when we see him, we are rescued from wanting to be the greatest. When we truly see him, we are rescued from wanting to be at the head. When we truly see him, we are rescued from wanting to get all of the attention. But there is a phenomenon that we must reckon with. Sometimes we don't always see what is right in front of us. Sometimes we don't see what is right in front of us. Let's take a look at the text, and I want to show you something. 
I was struck by two sentences that bookend the verses that we read tonight, the verses that we're considering. Listen to this, verses 24 and 27 we read tonight, right? Verse 24 starts, a dispute arose among them. Verse 27, near the end, and Jesus said, I am among you. A dispute arose among them, and Jesus said, I am among you. In these pieces of the passage, we see two groups of people. One group, the disputation, it's just them. It's just the disciples, and they are disputing. In the other passage, in the other group, it's the disciples, and Jesus is with them. When they only saw each other, their flesh, their desires, they gravitated toward their sin nature. But Jesus would say to them, guys, guys, that's what the world does. This is how the world acts. I need you to see me. The dispute arose so naturally, but supernatural was there too. The dispute was the result of their pride, but humility was there too. The dispute came because they only saw themselves, but Jesus was there too. And they had to see him because for their new calling, in this new covenant, during this new kingdom, they would need a recollection of love and humility, love and courage, love and victory to sustain them. And this argument, this dispute could not be the last thing they remembered. Jesus would say to them, all that you have witnessed in me leading up to this moment leaves you no doubt that I am the greatest among you. Yet, I am among you as your servant. See me, serve, then serve others as I have served you. And in the same way, tonight, body of Christ, Jesus is among us. In this milieu, it's difficult to love but he mandates a new kind of love. In this day where we're being encouraged to get and to grab, take it all because it's our right, he calls us to service and he calls us to humility. Jesus is among us because he loves us. He is among us to serve us. He is among us but not like us, among us but for us, desiring that we see him that we be like him. See his kindness towards us, and then we will be kind to one another. See his forgiveness, and we would in turn forgive one another. In this day, where the picture of love is grainy and blurry, will we see him? Let's pray. God, give us new eyes. Give us a new vision of the day in which we live. It calls us to see you lifted above the fray. Lead us by Holy Spirit to mimic and model your life of love, and hospitality, and humility. And we'll know that you'll get glory in it all. We ask this for Christ's sake. Amen.